Hi there. So today I'd like to get into the idea of where does quantization or discretization come from? And this is also going to serve as a review of classical standing waves before we launch into quantum and solving the Schrodinger's equation. So, let me restate, we've said it before but it bears restating, that the superposition principle is basically just the idea that if you have two or more waves that are moving through a medium at the same place in the same time, then the resultant value will be the sum of all those waves um, at that point. Okay, so you're going to have the algebraic sum of the values of the wave functions for the individual waves, and these are called linear waves if they obey the superposition principle. So the implications for this are that if you have two traveling waves and they pass through each other, um, say one's moving leftward and one's moving rightward, um, then they're going to pass through each other and move through. At the point where they meet up, they're going to add together, um, and then they'll be able to move away from each other and not be altered. Okay? When they combine, it's going to be interference, okay? constructive and destructive interference. A classical example of that would be shown here in this little image. They have a slinky or some kind of spring that's stretched out, and somebody on this end of the uh, spring and this end of the spring send two separate wave pulses. One's traveling this way, one's traveling this way. You can see them approaching each other here. And then they meet and they add together to be a taller um, displacement of the spring than either one would be individually. But then once they um, have met, they move away from each other and continue on down the line. So that's an um, obedience of the superposition principle. And the fact is that quantum waves do the same thing. Now let's assume that you have two waves and they have the same amplitude, frequency, and wavelength and they're traveling in opposite directions in a medium. So let's just say, for example, that, one's, uh, that they're both sine functions. Y1 is A sine Kx minus omega t. Um, that's the rightward traveling wave and y2 is a sine kx plus omega t. That's the leftward traveling wave. These things are going to meet together and add. So if you perform the addition of what's going to happen there, then you'll see that your resultant wave will be y is equal to 2a sine kx times cosine omega t. Okay? So this is the wave function. Now, if these waves are confined to a medium, so unlike our previous example of the springs, uh, where it showed them just moving away and the pulse just moved away. Let's say that these waves are, are there and they're being generated and they're staying within the medium. So you have, say, for example, um, a tube with air in it and sound moving through the tube like you see here. Or you could think of a string that's being stretched and it's oscillating in one way on one side and the other way on the other side. Then it's going to interfere and it's going to form what's called a standing wave because the wave is confined and it's forced to stay in the same place and not move on outside of the medium. Okay, So if you observe a standing wave, it doesn't look like there's any kind of motion going on in the direction of propagation of either of the original waves. Okay, So for example, I talked about the wave on the string. This would be what it would look like, for example, if you have a motor driving waves on two opposite ends then it forms this little envelope. It's blurred out because your eye can't track the motion of the string that fast, and so it looks blurred out. And you see um, this sort of beautiful double humped envelope forming here for this example. All right. Now, it obeys that function, 2a sine kx times the cosine of omega t. Okay. So the wave itself, the standing wave, the envelope, isn't moving. But each element within the medium is oscillating up and down with um, angular frequency omega. Okay, So that's what happens. Standing waves are formed. And it's because <coughs> constructive interference happens and destructive interference happens. If it's forced to stay in the same medium all the time, the destructive terms eventually go away. Okay, They, they cancel out and they go away. And all that's left is the constructive interference, which is what's forming this envelope here. Now, <coughs> for a standing wave, you get nodes and antinodes. Nodes occur at points of zero amplitude, and antinodes occur at points of maximum amplitude and displacement. So let's say that you have a string fixed at both ends, and that string has a length L, and you set up standing waves um, and, and have it go. There's different solutions, there's different um, uh, things that can happen depending upon how you're driving it, how fast you're driving it. So the ends of the string are necessarily going to be nodes. They're fixed and they can have zero displacement. But the boundary condition 
uh, will set up, this boundary condition will set up a series of standing waves, and as long as the ends are fixed, it's a possible solution to the standing wave. So, for example, here is the first what's called normal mode or possible solution to the standing wave. And it's when you have one half wavelength um, forming here, okay? So you can see that it's half of a wave, okay? So that means that your wavelength is going to be two times the length of the string, okay? Or two times the length or distance between those boundaries or nodes. So that's going to form. Now, other possible solutions in, uh, in, uh, are, can occur. As long as you can have a node fixed at the ends, then it can form a standing wave. So, for example, here we have a node in the middle, but we still have the two nodes on the end, okay? And that's a possible solution. Now, this is one full wavelength. So here, lambda is equal to L, and that's the second mode. The third mode is also possible, where you have nodes on the end and you have two nodes in the middle, okay? And that corresponds to a wavelength of 2L over 3. So all of these are possible solutions. You could keep going with it. You could add in another node in the middle, so that you would have three nodes in the middle, all right? And that would correspond to a wavelength of L over 2, and so on and so forth. So all of these are possible depending upon what the drive frequency is um, and the tension in the string for this example. There's other factors, um, but I hope you see the point there. Okay, so in other words, the normal modes for a string of length L fixed at both ends are going to be equal to lambda is equal to 2L over N, where N is the nth normal mode of oscillation, and those are the possible modes for the string. Now, since for a wave propagating through a medium, V is equal to lambda F, where lambda is the wavelength and F is the frequency, then you also have chosen the natural frequency if the speed of the wave is fixed, which it would be if you had a certain tension in the string, for example. So here you have the frequency of the nth normal mode, which is equal to N V over 2L, solving for, um, solving for the frequency in terms of V is equal to lambda F. So your natural frequencies are fixed as well. What this means is that if you have your first normal mode, then n is going to be equal to 1, and your frequency is going to be equal to v over 2l. And then any other frequency of oscillation will be an integer multiple of that first normal mode. And that's stated here, f sub n is equal to n times f1, okay? And frequencies of those normal modes for what's called a harmonic series, and the normal modes are often called harmonics. And this is uh, really evident when you think about what's happening to a guitar. The musical notes defined by its fundamental frequency. You can alter that frequency by changing the speed of the wave in the medium by altering the tension in the string. Um, and you can do that by uh, turning these knobs up here. Or you can change the length of the string by moving your finger and placing it at different places, often guided by the position of these frets right here. So you can change the length of the string, and that also changes the frequency of oscillation, which changes the sound of the um, note that you hear. Now, middle C on a piano has a fundamental frequency of 262 hertz. So the next two harmonics would be the multiples of that. So 262, 524, 786, and so on and so forth. All right, so that's kind of a review of standing waves and classical waves on a string. Now, this may sound a little boring to you, okay? A little boring. But it's important to remember that this very simple idea of the fact that when you have waves that are traveling through the medium and then they're fixed so that they have to be confined to a certain space, like waves traveling through a spring, string that are fixed on the two ends, that gives rise to certain set frequencies, certain allowed frequencies for that medium. Now remember, for matter waves, when you fix the frequency, you've also fixed the energy, okay? So if you take the idea that matter, that particles have a wave nature, that they have a wavelength, and then you take the idea that you're going to confine those particles to a certain region of space, then it's not a huge leap to imagine the fact that those particles, those particle waves, are going to form standing waves, and that those standing waves give rise to certain frequencies. And we've already seen that certain frequencies give rise to energies, and that gives rise to energy levels. You might have heard of energy levels. For example, electrons confined to orbit around atoms have energy levels. So if they're closest to the nucleus, they're bound more tightly. And then the energy of the electron can change as it jumps from energy level to energy level in discrete quantized steps. 
This is only possible because matter is a wave and you have constructive and destructive interference. So those allowed energy levels are going to be the ones where constructive interference is happening and they're not going to be allowed to exist in between those levels where destructive interference happens. They can't exist there. So all of this happens, this quantization, this energy levels, all of quantum mechanics happens because matter has wave particle duality and it has a wave nature. And when you can find a wave, standing waves form, leading to quantization of energy levels. Okay? That's it. That's all quantum mechanics right there. Now, the Schrodinger equation, which we're going to discuss in the next lecture, sets up the conditions for these matter waves, these probability waves. All right? Now, these matter waves, the wave functions for them can be complex. So since we're reviewing classical ideas and simple ideas, I thought maybe now would be a good time to review complex numbers in case it's been a while since you thought about that. So complex numbers. This is a brief introduction or review. I really hope you're bored by this, okay? I want you to be bored by this. <laughs> Remember that imaginary numbers were developed around the time of the Reformation and the imaginary number i is the square root of minus one. Now in some notation they go by j, in our class we'll go by i is the square root of minus one. So if you square i, you get minus one. And three i would be the square root of minus nine. So what you do to have an imaginary number is you take the square root of the real number, like for example the square root of nine is three, and then you multiply it times the imaginary number and that's the solution to that problem. Now just like anything else, five apples minus three apples is two apples, 5i minus 3i is 2i. There you have it. Now, a complex number is a combination of a real number and an imaginary number, like a plus bi. a would be the real part, and b would be the imaginary part. Complex doesn't mean complicated, okay? Not here. Complex means a combination, kind of like a building complex, as buildings join together. It means that the two types of numbers, the real and imaginary part, together form a complex. Now, when you have two complex numbers, you can handle the addition um, by, and subtraction by adding the real parts together and, imaginary, and adding the imaginary parts together separately. So, for example, if you wanted to add a plus bi and c plus di, you would add the real parts, a plus c, and then you would add the imaginary parts, b plus d, and then that would be multiplied by i to give you your new complex number. So, for example, 3 plus 2i plus 1 plus 7i would be 4 plus 9i because 3 plus 1 is 4 and 2 plus 7 is 9. Now, to multiply complex numbers, you're just going to use the FOIL method, first, outside, inside, last. So, a plus bi times c plus di would be ac plus adi plus bci plus bdi squared, okay? So, that's how you do that. Now, a complex conjugate is where we change the sign on the imaginary part. So, if you take the complex conjugate of a plus bi, then it's a minus bi. Now, conjugates are often used in division of complex numbers to avoid having imaginary numbers in the denominator, okay? So, if you wanted to get rid of this 5i part in the denominator, then you would multiply this fraction, uh, both the top and the bottom, by 4 plus 5i, and that would give you your complex um, conjugate there. Now, we also use complex conjugates when we start talking about wave functions in the Schrodinger equation. For example, the probability density function, the absolute value of psi squared, is really the wave function's complex conjugate, psi star, times the wave function. Okay? So, that's that. Sometimes we look at numbers on the complex plane. Okay? So, remember, a real number line is sort of all along the horizontal axis here with the positive numbers stretching to infinity going to the right and the negative numbers stretching to infinity going to the left. But if you want to do a complex number, like 3 plus 4i, you have to add a vertical axis. And the vertical axis would be the imaginary numbers i to, you know, infinity i going upwards, and then minus i to negative infinity i going downwards. And then you would just plot the number on the uh, complex plane um, using the uh, real part as the horizontal coordinate and the imaginary part as the vertical coordinate. You could also write it in polar form. That's a really common way to do it. Um, so x plus i, y would be then um, r, which is the distance from the origin to the point, um, times cosine theta plus i, r sine of theta, or r times cosine theta plus i sine theta. 
Now that cosine theta plus I sine theta should look slightly familiar to you because that's actually the Euler identity. E to the I theta is cosine theta plus I sine theta. So another way to write that would have been R E to the I theta, okay? Also remember that E to the minus I theta is cosine theta minus I sine theta, okay? And you can define your trigonometric functions, sine theta and cosine th theta, in terms of e to the i theta and e to the minus, minus i theta, as shown here. So, whether you knew it or not, all along, you've been using complex numbers. Now, why do I talk about this? Because our wave function, as solved by the Schrodinger equation, is a complex number. And so it's important to review this idea and know that you're going to have to use complex numbers and complex conjugates. Now, in this class, our introductory physics class, most of the solutions that we're going to be dealing with are real, okay? So there's nothing saying that the wave function has to be complex. The wave function can be a real solution if the potential uh, energy that is solving the Schrodinger equation is simple enough. And that's the ones that we're going to be looking at here. But if you go on and study more quantum mechanics, there's no guarantees that your wave function is going to be a real number at all times. And this isn't too surprising. Remember that wave functions are oscillatory, and as we've seen here, oscillatory functions have complex parts to them. Okay, so there you go. All right, um, I hope you got something out of that. As always, I'm here if you need, if you have any questions, and I'll see you in class.